Thank you for watching this video from the Canada-Europe Transatlantic Dialogue at Carleton University. This event is sponsored by the Canada-Europe Transatlantic Dialogue, CETD, and the Faculty of Public Affairs Research Month at Carleton University. CETD receives funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. The views expressed in this video are solely those of the presenter and do not reflect the views of the CETD, SHRC, or Carleton University. So thank you very much for this invitation and thank you all for being there, listening to, to us. Um, I'm going to talk about social Europe. So uh, what I'm going to go through is three different uh, parts of my uh, <coughs> presentation and then uh, some final remarks. Um, I thought I should incorporate in my presentation some pr uh, historical perspective of the building of the European social model, just to give you, you know, the uh, context of uh, in which uh, this was uh, decided, and uh, especially because words and expressions are very important for the European Union, uh, you know, buzzwords and how you conceive things. Okay, then um, because it's the lowest hours to talk about uh, the European social model, because as you know, we are ridden by a multifaceted crisis right now. Um, I'll uh, go on with the shadows and end up with the lights so that I can end up on a more optimistic uh, position. Now, um, the EU is primarily an economic union, not a social one. And that has always, uh, uh, you know, uh, must be always taken into account. Taken into account. Okay, so from the uh, very creation of the union up to the present, uh, social policy, social protection policies have been understood in different ways. So, uh, from the, uh, for the period uh, from 1957 uh, uh, to 1988, uh, 87, uh, social development was uh, conceived just as a mere natural consequence from economic growth. Economic growth would bring with it higher social protection. Remember that at that point, uh, the members, the, the member states of the union were very few and uh, very alike in terms of social, of uh, economic development. So social protection was not uh, such an issue at that, at that point. Then from 1987 to 1991, uh, the economic and social cohesion within the single market took uh, another uh, way of seeing things. So it's, it's not just economic cohesion, but also social one, yeah? And uh, this uh, led uh, to the Charter of the Fundamental Rights. This is for workers, not, not for citizens. Uh, so um, uh, this view uh, makes a big step ahead. And then from 1991 to 1996, after the Maastricht Treaty, um, the Union was focusing on promoting employment, but also solidarity uh, with it. Finally, for the, uh, uh, from 1996 to year 2000, social uh, policy was recognized as a factor for attaining sustained economic growth. And this is uh, sort of you know, the highest uh, uh, hierarchy of social policy ever reached. Okay, so uh, the European social model uh, could be said that it was coined by Commissioner Jacques Delors in the Val Summit in 1985, yeah? Uh, with the principles of solidarity, equality, and social cohesion. So the European social model uh, has been uh, talked about and discussed ever since uh, in the literature and by policymakers and administrators. And uh, sort of four different understandings have emerged. The first is uh, that it is an ideational, ideational abstraction, yeah? Um, not a real model, but something you're sort of uh, pursuing, yeah? Something you're, that you're walking towards. Uh, it's also understood as a feeble construction because of the ample and uh, with every enlargement increasing uh, variety or heterogeneity of uh, the welfare states, of the national welfare states. Uh, it's also, an, uh, further, it's, it is also understood as a transnational welfare state with a common minimum denominator. So what the policies uh, uh, that are cooked up in, in Brussels do is establish a sort of common denominator for every country. And I highlight uh, the fourth uh, 
um, approximation because that is crucial. I mean, probably that's the most important one for the functioning of the union, a legitimizing political project and process. So that legitimizing fu function is essential in the sense that if you look at uh, Eurobarometer data on the preferences of citizens, of EU citizens, uh, what they all have in common is that uh, they are not only they identify with uh, living in a country where there is a developed uh, full, uh, welfare state, yeah, but also that without that uh, social protection policies, uh, uh, that would be, you know, the whole EU would be really delegitimized, yeah? So it has to work in both directions. Good. But social policies, uh, social protection policies, follow uh, the subsidiarity principle within the EU. So that social Europe has always been subordinated to the process of European economic integration. So the focus is uh, the uh, highlights, the uh, uh, emphasis uh, are always dependent on um, you know, the economic context, uh, the economic cycle, and so on and so forth. And it's a very changeable agenda. Mm? Uh, and uh, this means obviously that uh, social protection policies are limited by these principles of subsidiarity and that European institutions are only able to define the guiding principles and the ideological approaches of common social, social protection policy. So they have a very uh, intense role in what is called uh, cognitive Europeanization. So uh, that, uh, well, the way of doing things, the ideas on how to implement them, the approaches uh, is what the European Commission, is how the European Commission can influence uh, national governments into moving in one direction or another in social protection. But the EU also bears an indirect influence. For example, through European funds, uh, because the uh, lending of money for whatever the social purposes goes together usually with building, for example, administrative or enhancing administrative capabilities by the different uh, uh, governments. Uh, but also, uh, Developing uh, Eurostat and the Eurobarometer, especially the Eurostat, has meant that you can count on homogeneous indicators that are comparable across the whole uh, European Union. And that is crucial, yeah, because uh, it's the only way to know exactly where countries, where regions, where municipalities are in comparison. Mm? And uh, in, in this way, it becomes a very useful tool for formulating social protection policies and uh, social assistance ones as well. Okay, uh, the issue uh, at the turn of the millennium was precisely how to overcome the principle of subsidiarity to which the, na the, the, the member states were not ready to renounce, but how to uh, make the European Commission or put in the, in, in the European Commission's hands uh, a tool that was able to somehow overcome subsidiarity. So, and this is called, as you very well know, uh, the Lisbon Strategy, uh, which covered the first decade of the millennium. And in the case of social protection policies, what was uh, invented was the open method of coordination, or uh, also considered soft governance, because uh, obviously, uh, the objective is harmonizing uh, among social protection systems um, uh, rather than making them converge. And uh, what it's uh, looking at is at you know, reaching certain ends, or certain objectives, rather than the means that each member state has to use to, you know, to get there. Uh, it's soft governance because it's uh, mainly recommendations what the, the European Commission does. It's not directives or hard legislation. Uh, what the uh, open method of coordination seeks is to build up synergies and mutual learning processes among member states so that member states decide on the definition of, com of uh, common indicators and common targets to be reached both uh, in the quantitative and the qualitative sense, they, um, because they build their own uh, national plans and, then, and they are published, 
then there's an exchange of best practices and also of periodic peer evaluation. Also, this leads obviously to naming and shaming, yeah? Uh, so, uh, because you have uh, heterogeneous, uh, uh, homogeneous indicators and targets are set, uh, then obviously when this is evaluated, it's perfectly known which member states, which regions are doing better or which are doing uh, worse. According to the uh, targets that are set for the whole of the Union, but also to the targets that are set uh, individually by each country. Um, so uh, the, the uh, OMC um, uh, applied to social protection policies mirrored very much uh, already the European employment strategy, which was in, uh, uh, introduced in 1997. Um, and then um, the OMC also incorporated in 2000 social inclusion and social protection. Um, the NAPINs and the uh, NRPs are the, uh, precisely the uh, national reports that are uh, elaborated every two years. Um, and then um, uh, regarding social inclusion in the first place and regarding pensions, health care and uh, long-term long care in the second one. And this becomes a joint report, uh, uh, both issued by the European Commission and the Parliament. So, uh, as we, uh, you also know, uh, probably uh, the targets of Lisbon were not uh, uh, reached. So there was a revision of the Lisbon st strategy at the middle of the decade in 2005. Uh, and in this revision, uh, the, um, uh, well, it was decided to displace uh, very much social inclusion targets in favor of growth and employment creation. So the initial uh, objectives were sort of changed. The Lisbon strategy was followed by the 2020 strategy, which is the next decade, and we are in the middle of it. So that since uh, 2010, uh, the uh, unequal impact of the crisis on the, of, on, on the different member states and, uh, and also because obviously uh, every state had different national political responses, uh, reduced, you know, sort of uh, uh, the OMC achievements of the, of the previous uh, decades. So the new strategy had to uh, deal with that and uh, to recover primacy of social inclusion, social protection, and the fight against poverty. In fact, um, uh, the fight against poverty was uh, uh, considered a flagship initiative, which is sort of highest rank, yeah, uh, considered the highest rank objective. Among those seven objectives, uh, the, uh, the employment rate should reach 75 percent by 2020. Uh, then there's also some objectives of uh, on energy, uh, you know, reduction of, of carbon uh, emissions by 20%, and also the increase of renewable energies also by 20%, the reduction of early school leavers below 10%, the increase of university graduates up to 40%, and the reduction of 20%, uh, of, uh, about 20 million people in the whole of Europe, of the poverty rate. Uh, for that purpose, the uh, a, a European platform against poverty and social exclusion has been created. And the main aim of this platform is to promote social innovation for vulnerable groups. So this is uh, the 2020 strategy that is being revised right now. As, an, as you can imagine, because of the impact of the crisis, revisions are going to be uh, substantial. Yeah. So going on to the shadows, I say crisis with a a red E, because it's several crises at the same time. So it's low hours for social uh, Europe, uh, and uh, that means that social uh, uh, endeavors are uh, currently in a social uh, downward spiral. Uh, it, this is also because of harsh austerity. I call it, the, I call it their oikin under the pillow, so by, by Walter uh, Oikin and ordo liberalism. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so there is uh, an increasing, uh, the, the crisis has also produced uh, the economic one, uh, increasing economic and social heterogeneity among the 28 member states uh, with the successive uh, enlargements. We have the problem, uh, as, you, as it has already been mentioned, of Brexit and Brexit, 
which are both major challenges to the European cohesion and stability. I, uh, you know, I, I, I was reading The Economist a couple of weeks ago, and uh, their advice was uh, for uh, people in Great Britain to vote in the June referendum as pro-European Eurosceptics. Yeah. <laughs> We have a problem with migrants and refugees, and uh, uh, also with uh, uh, the new economic <laughs> governance fr uh, framework. Uh, the fiscal deficit controls, you know, harsh austerity, and me meant that, uh, um, well, the, sign the signature of the Treaty on Stability, Coordination and Governance of the European Mo and Monetary Union, and the introduction of the European Semester, which is a totally new governance tool. This is what, uh, who does what in the European semester. I'm not going into it. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to show you that nothing is simple in Europe, yeah? Okay, so um, social Europe is under pressure of budgetary uh, commitments and the European institution shaping of responses to the crisis has entailed the mutation of the European Central Bank from a monetary to a political institution imposing certain measures on countries rule-based management of the Eurozone crisis, national uh, labor law reforms, uh, so one still has to wonder whether fundamental rights uh, still matter. So we're going sort of from flex security to flex precarity, so everybody's, uh, you know, quality of, of jobs is decreasing. And uh, policy making has been rescaled upwards, so the union tells uh, the member states what to do, and the member states tell the regions and the municipalities what to do in terms of budgets and how much to spend. So, uh, uh, as already mentioned, social consequences uh, have been very, very deep uh, uh, because of a long-lasting social crisis. So we have increased economic, political, and cultural heterogeneity, growing inequalities between and within EU member states. The harmonization process is obviously compromised. And uh, in many welfare state, in many member states, there's been a drastic reduction of social protection, uh, labor rights, quality of employment, and social dialogue. Uh, this all coupled with sluggish economic growth and uh, very much undermining the legit le legitimacy of the European project as a whole. Okay, lights, and I'll finish in a couple of minutes. Uh, this is my almost my last point. Um, there, are, there have been recent attempts at what we call socializing the European semester, socializing the new way of, uh, you know, the new mode of economic governance of the Union. So the, the Union has introduced an employment package in April 2012, a compact for growth and jobs in June 2012, a youth employment package in December of the same year, a social investment package uh, supported by the European Social Fund in uh, 2013. So, and we also, it's very important that we, uh, the Union is changing uh, from uh, this idea of one size fits all recommendations and impositions to specific recommendations for each uh, member state. So, um, mm, What's going on here? No, no, I was pressing the say button. Oh, God. Two, one, two, 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 three, lights. Okay. Uh, towards a triple A social Europe. This is how uh, uh, commissioner, uh, I mean, the, the director of the European Commission, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, framed it in October uh, 2014 in his speech before the European Parliament. So uh, the semester, yeah, the new governance tools is uh, about more than just the economy. So this idea of uh, introducing more social uh, elements into the European semester were elaborated in the five presidents' report, meaning five presidents from five different European, European Union um, institutions, and uh, the creation of a common social protection floor. So it's uh, going towards enhanced democratic uh, accountability and legitimacy by strengthening parliamentary controls. For example, uh, the annual growth survey, which is what the semester produces, yeah? 
should be discussed in national parliaments before and after issuance. Also, civil society and social actors in each member states uh, should be more engaged in the key points uh, of each semester. So I don't know whether this, this is going to get uh, a tri triple A, but at least it's a major change of direction in uh, the relevance, in the salience of social policy issues. So my final remarks are that um, the uh, 2016 uh, AGS, uh, uh, and already uh, somewhat uh, in, in the two previous years already, is searching for a balance between increased social investment and labor market flexicurity. Uh, there are three uh, new headline indicators in the uh, 2016 Alert Mechanism Report, uh, which are activity rates, youth unemployment, and long-term unemployment, which are being going to be monitored mu uh, much more uh, intensely. And uh, uh, the same uh, document is somewhat encouraging in the sense that it reveals a more socially balanced approach uh, towards uh, the present semester. Uh, obviously, the actual impact of all these measures is yet to be seen. There's much ground to, to be recovered, but at least uh, you know, the approach of uh, both of the European institutions has uh, changed, and uh, that uh, leaves some uh, room for hope. So thank you.